Dear participants, welcome to this webinar, which is dedicated to the basis of the Raman spectroscopy applied to proteins. My name is Katarina David, and I am an application scientist in the Horibas Raman spectroscopy application lab. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start with some general explanation about the Raman effect and technique. Then, I will introduce you the Raman spectroscopy basics for proteins. The main keywords will be listed and explained using examples. Some conclusions will be exposed at the end. Raman spectroscopy is based on the Raman effect. So, let us briefly introduce the Raman effect. Raman technique is a vibrational technique. It deals with molecules' vibrations. We take example with a molecule. If an incident laser excitation will interact with this molecule, the molecule will vibrate. The atoms and bonds will vibrate too. After interaction, the light can be reflected, absorbed or diffused. A part of the light is diffused without the frequency change, I mean elastically. And this is the Rayleigh diffusion. There is as well a small part of the light, 10 minus 6, of the diffused light, which changes the frequency inelastically. And this is the Raman scattering. This difference corresponds to the characteristic vibrations of the analyzed sample. So, from a given Raman spectrum, which will be the information that we can get? Each chemical bonds or groups of bonds will be characterized by specific vibrational frequencies. Different vibrational bands in the Raman spectrum will be assigned to each frequency. By analyzing these bands, we can obtain rich information as follows. The band position in centimeters minus one will tell you, uh, you will tell you what kind of chemical species the molecule contains. The band position can shift due to the environment changes of the molecule. These shifts can provide important information on the molecule interaction with the external factors, as for example, temperature, pressure or chemical reactions. For each vibration, the Raman band will have a specific width. Often, the chemical reactions of the molecules or their conformational changes can lead to the changes of this width. It is well known, for example, how the hydrogen bonding will affect the band width. And, of course, one of the most important parameters of the Raman band is the intensity. Generally speaking, the intensity should be proportional to the sample concentration. More molecules will be excited by the laser, more signal we will get. This can be actually true for Raman efficient samples and not complicated ones. For example, proteins, aqueous or buffered solutions. In case of tissues or cells, it is difficult to relate the intensity to the absolute concentration. That is why, especially in these cases, only the relative intensity will be analyzed. This presentation will focus on proteins, as I said earlier. Proteins represent more than half of the mass of a biological sample, tissue, cell, and so on. They play a crucial role in the functioning of the organism by performing various functions. The knowledge of their native or non-native conformation or of their interactions with the complex biological and chemical environment is important for the understanding of their role in the organism. Generally speaking, the Raman spectrum of a protein will reflect its conformation. This means that it is very important to know and to understand the protein Raman spectrum. In the following, we will see what we are looking for in the Raman spectrum of proteins. The Raman spectrum of a protein is complex. The basic units in the structure of a protein are the amino acids. Several amino acids will join together 
through the peptide bond to form polypeptide chains, which will fold in a specific way in order to form a protein. This is the Raman spectrum of an amino acid. Now, let's see a Raman spectrum of a protein, which can contain hundreds of amino acids. We can observe different bands in the spectrum. These bands are assigned to different amino acids and to the various secondary structures of the protein. There are several levels of organization of the protein's structures. Primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structures. Raman technique is a powerful tool to analyze the secondary structure of the proteins. The secondary structure strongly depends on the spatial arrangement of the peptide bonds, more precisely of carbonyl bonds. These carbonyl bonds will vibrate and the coupling of these vibrations will lead to the formation of one vibrational band called amide 1 band. The precise position of this band depends on the, on the inter- and intramolecular effects. There are nine types of vibrations modes for the amide bands of proteins. These are called A, B and from 1 to 7 in order of decreasing frequency. They have their origin in the vibration of the different atomic groups of the polypeptide chain. The most important amide bands are the amide 1, 2 and 3 bands. These vibrational band, Raman bands are strongly related to the protein structure and conformation. The amide 1 band has its origin mainly in the vibration of the carbonyl groups. Different types of secondary structures Alpha helix beta sheets are characterized by am amide 1 bands of slightly different positions and shapes. Databases of Raman spectra and X ray diffraction structures of proteins have been analyzed. A correlation between different types of secondary structures and the position of the amide 1 bands is possible. The large bound can be fitted in several contributions, which will correspond to different types of secondary structure. The amide 2 band is more complex than the amide 1. It has its origin in the NH bending and CN stretching. It is a weak band and it can be observed only in UV resonance excitation. The amide 3 band has its origin mainly in the CN bending and HN stretching. The structure of an amide 3 band can be seen in the spectrum. This band can be correlated to the amide 1 band because it gives complementary structural information on the protein structure. In this way, it is possible to get some additional details uh, to the amide band. As you could see, the Rama spectrum of proteins is very rich. Of course, there are other important bands in the spectrum, as for example, the bands assigned to disulfide bonds and aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, histidine, and so on. The SS bond is an important structural key feature in the protein structure. It is a protein chain stabilizer. Experiences as well as the theoretical calculations show that the SS Raman bands in proteins are located in the spectral range of 500 to 550 cm minus 1. They are also very complex bands. Being part of the protein chain, the vibrations of the SS bond 
can be strongly affected by several factors. The relative conformation of the surrounding atoms. Depending on the protein chain conformation, the SS bands can have slightly different bands position. Another factor is the mode coupling, because the vibrations of the diagonal angle can be mixed. And of course, the hydrogen bonding. Band shifts and widening can be possible. In this figure, you can see, as an example, the excess Roman bands in lysozyme. The structure of this protein is stabilized by four disulfide bridges, which seem to have different conformations around the diagonal angle, each with the, its own Raman band position, cis, 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 trans, and trans, trans. Other important spectral features in proteins are the aromatic amino acids and some of them are very important for the protein structure and activity, as for example tyrosine, tryptophan and phenylalanine, here represented. Usually they are located in the hydrophobic pockets, like binding sites, for example, of the protein structure. They are sensitive to the microenvironment. The position of the Raman bands of the main aromatic amino acid is well known, as you can see in this table. And in the following, I will give more details concerning these three amino acids, phenylalanine, tryptophan and tyrosine. Phenylalanine shows a very intense band at 1000 cm minus 1 assigned to the ring breeding mode. This band is not sensitive to conformational changes of protein and, therefore, it can be used for the normalization of the Rama spectra of protein. In the protein Rama spectrum, the phenylalanine band can be more or less intense depending on the number of the phenylalanine amino acids in the protein structure. The second important amino acid is the tryptophan. The tryptophan shows two interesting spectral regions, the Fermi duplet and the, the region around 1010 cm minus 4. The components of the Fermi doublet were found around 1360 and 1340 cm minus 4. The intensity of these bands and uh, precisely the ratio of, the, of these intensity, intensities serves as a hydrophobicity marker. The 1360 cm1 compound of the doublet is strong in hydrophobic solvents, whereas in the hydrophilic environment, the 1340 cm1 component is stronger. The 1010 cm band is sensitive to the strength of the van der Waals interactions of the phenyl ring of the tryptophan with surrounding residues. Wave numbers near or below 1010 cm one indicate weak or no van der Waals interaction, while increasing wave numbers near 1012 or higher reflect stronger van der Waals interaction. The third important amino acid is the tyrosine. The most important Raman bands of tyrosine are doublet near 830 and 850 cm minus 1, as you can see in this image. The relative intensity of the two bands is very sensitive to the tyrosine environment. The intensity of these two bands depend on the hydrogen bonding condition of the phenol side chain. So, the relative intensity of these two peaks is often analyzed in order to study the exposition of the phenol group 
of the tyrosine to the solvent. Note that analyzing the ratio of the doublet, you can obtain information on the folding and refolding processes in protein, as for example, the study of the normal and cataractous or unfolded protein lenses. The proteins are complex structures and the Raman spectra are complex. Nevertheless, the information coming from the analysis of the Raman spectra are valuable. So, we can check the polypeptide chain, thus the secondary and even the tertiary structure can be analyzed. We can also check some amino acids from side chains. In this case, it is possible to study the effect of the molecular and chemical environment of proteins since the aromatic amino acids are sensitive to the microenvironment. To summarize, the protein Raman spectrum contains information about the backbone, the aromatic amino acids, and intramolecular interaction. We saw which are the most important spectral features in the protein Rama spectrum. However, when studying proteins, it is very important to take into account the environment. There are some important environmental factors that can affect the protein conformation, thus its Rama spectrum. So, let us discover them. As you may know, four major types of interactions stabilize the native structure of protein. They are the hydrogen bonds, the covalent disulfide bonds, the ionic bonds and the hydrophobic effect. The most important factors that can affect this interaction, thus the spatial conformation of the protein, are changes in pH, variation of salt concentration, variation of the temperature, the Raman spectroscopy allows the analysis of the conformational changes in protein. And in the next slide, I will develop some of these effects on the conformational changes in proteins. The variation of the pH induces changes in the ionization of proteins side chains, hence the salt bridges formation or breaking. On the other hand, the hydrogen bonds are disturbed too. Usually, it is, it is an action that can be reversible, except for the limit values for the pH, too acidic or too basic. A representative example is the study done by L. Pola and all on rice globulin protein for the different pH values. They found a slightly shift of amide 1 and amide 3 bands indicating a transition from alpha helical structure near neutral pH to anti-parallel beta sheets and disorder structures at highly acidic and alkaline conditions. Extreme pHs also shifted the CH vibrations to higher wave numbers, suggesting the formation of the random coil structures associated with protein denaturation. Increases in intensity of the amide 1, CH bending and CH stretching vibrations at extreme pHs are, are also indicators for the protein denaturation. As the temperature is increased, a number of bonds in the protein molecule are weakened. The first affected are the long-range interactions that are necessary for the presence of the tertiary structure. As these bonds are first weakened and then probably broken, the protein obtains a more flexible structure and the groups are exposed to the solvent. If hitting the protein, it should be able to readily refold to the native structure. As heating continues, some of the hydrogen bonds that stabilize for example, the helical structure will begin to break. As these bonds are broken, 
Water can interact and form new hydrogen bonds with the peptide bonds of the proton. This is obvious in the example below, which is a study of the thermal denaturation of a protein called human haptoglobin. The authors highlighted the fact that the Raman spectrum of the protein change by increasing the temperature. And the most important changes concern the amide 1 band regions and amide 3 band. A basic example of the environment effect is the protein interaction with the solvent. Here you have two Rama spectra of lysozyme. The blue spectrum measured for the lysozyme in aqueous solution and the green spectrum is measured for the lysozyme in lyophilized powder. At first sight, the spectra look very similar, but let's get a careful look on the amide wine bands. We observe a change of the band's width as well as a slight shift of the maxima. It seems that there is a small change in the secondary structure of the protein. The origin of these shifts and broadness is the hydrogen bonds formation between the water molecule and protein atoms. Of course, further analysis by fitting will lead to the identification of the changes of the secondary the protein unfolding due to the reaction with the denaturant or methanol can be studied. Analysis can be performed on the amide 1 band and more methanol is added in solution, more changes are observed in the amide 1 band. These changes in the secondary structure can be quantified and related to the protein unfolding. Another representative example is the reductive unfolding of proteins. The structure of the serum albumin is stabilized by 17 disulfide bridges. The presence of reducing agents in protein solution will lead to the cleavage of the disulfide bridges. The polypeptide chain will be then unfolded. By measuring and then analyzing the Rama spectra before and after reaction, we can follow the protein unfolding. Two spectra regions can be analyzed, the SS band and the amide 1 band. During reaction, the SS bonds are cleaved and we note a decrease of the SS band's intensity in the spectrum before and after reaction. The analysis of the amide 1 band reveals the changes in the secondary structure, the same before and after reaction. In this example, the Raman analysis can be quantitative. Reaction rates can be calculated as well as the activation energy for the, for the reaction. As you can see, the data treatment is very important and it is based on the band's fitting. For the validation of the quantitative results, a good data statistics is necessary. As you may see, the environment influences the protein conformation. This is the reason why it is necessary to include or to mimic this environment when the studies on proteins are performed. And analyzing the Rama spectrum of a protein in different conditions and states can help us to obtain valuable information on the protein conformation. There are also other contributions or effects that can strongly affect the Rama spectrum. And in order to perform a correct interpretation of data, they need to be eliminated or at least decreased.
In the next slides, I will give you a few classical examples concerning the solvent, the fluorescence, and the signal to noise ratio contribution. The reactions in which are involved the proteins occur mostly in solution. The solvent could be a buffer solution, which will maintain the proteins at the physiological conditions. Also, the solvent can be the water. There are various buffer solutions containing different compounds. As in the case of proteins, these compounds have their own Raman spectrum, composed of one or more bands. When the spectrum of the mixture is measured, band overlap may occur, <coughs> which affects actually the Raman intensity and complicates the quantitative analysis. To overcome the problem due to the band overlap, different techniques like fitting, simulation of the Raman band are used to determine the contributions of the individual bands in the whole band envelope. Another available solution to this problem is to measure separately the Raman spectrum of all compounds from the mixture as the references and then subtract it. Furthermore, the situation becomes complex because there is po it is possible that the Raman bands of the buffer solution change the position, the form and even the relative intensity in the presence of protein. The most convenient solvent in terms of spectral contribution is water. Water strongly absorbs light at mid-infrared wavelength, and it is a weak Raman scatter, leading to little or no interference with the protein spectrum. Let us see how the water influences the spectrum of a protein. Here we have the Raman spectrum of lysozyme in aqua solution. If we measure the Raman spectrum of the water in the same instrumental conditions, we will have this spectrum. We can now extract the spectrum of the water from the spectrum of lysozyme in aqua solution. And in this way we are able to obtain the pure Raman spectrum of lysozyme. As you may see, the spectrum is not flat, I mean, is not to the zero level. It seems that there is also another contribution, and we will see it is about the fluorescence. So, another factor that can strongly affect the protein spectrum is the fluorescence. The fluorescence from the sample, or impurities, can cause significant background noise. This contribution may, may be more or less attenuated. If the fluorescence is an intrinsic property of the molecule, it is possible to attenuate it through the instrumental settings by optimizing the Raman signal using the right excitation wavelength, usually the laser lines close to infrared region, will greatly reduce the risks of the appearance of the fluorescence broadband in the spectra of proteins. But if the fluorescence is coming from the sample, so it's due only to the impurities, a purification of the sample using biochemical methods is required. Another alternative is to quench the fluorescence by exposing the sample to the laser beam a longer time while the impurities are decomposed. A compromise between the laser power and the spectral acquisition time is necessary since the longer acquisition can affect also the protein. Actually, every time when performing Raman measurements on biomolecules, we must take into account the exposure time and the subsequently the thermal degradation of molecules within the sample solution. Let us see how we can get rid of the fluorescence from the spectrum. So, we can keep the previous spectrum of the lysozyme, the pure one. The background of the fluorescence can be described mathematically by a polynomial function 
the degree of dysfunction needs to be chosen by the user in order to obtain the best fit of the experimental data. So, the experimental data are fitted with this polynomial function, and finally, after this Bayline correction, we obtain the clean Rama spectrum of the lysosome. And this time, the baseline, as you can observe, is very close to zero. Now, the spectral feature of the lysosome can be correctly analyzed. Please remember that after all these data treatments, the spectrum of the molecule should not be deformed. A quantitative spectral analysis based on Rama spectroscopy requires a Rama spectrum with minimal signal-to-noise ratio. Such spectra can be obtained after lengthy acquisitions in optimal conditions. On the other hand, the signal averaging is also a way to improve signal-to-noise ratio. Thus, an n number of spectra successively measured under completely identical conditions will be added. The signal-to-noise ratio will be improved by a factor of root square of n. These methods can be successively applied when the measurements are reproducible. Hence, the sample must be in chemical equilibrium. Here, we can observe how the acquisition time can affect the signal-to-noise ratio. A spectrum measured in one second only once is quite noisy, as you can see. Increasing the acquisition time to 20 seconds, already we can see an important improvement. We can also use a small acquisition time and increase the number of accumulations, something like 1 second and 100 accumulations. And this is similar with an acquisition time of 20 seconds and 4 accumulations. So we can play with the accumulations and the acquisition time in order to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. All the contributions to the Rama spectrum of proteins presented here can play a critical role sometimes in the Rama measurement. And their removal or decreasing depends on the sample and on the experimental conditions. The aim is to improve as much as possible the Rama signal, the Raman intensity actually, coming from the protein. And all this without deforming the original data. There are possibilities for these improvements as well as for the complete spectral analysis of proteins. And I would like to underline them to you in the following. One of these possibilities can be the deep ultraviolet resonance Raman spectroscopy. It has been demonstrated to be a powerful tool for structural characterization of protein. The UV Raman resonance is used mainly for studying peptides and protein structure as well as their dynamics. Resonance Raman is especially important for organic and biological molecules since strong absorption typically occur in the deep UV and resonances enhancement of millions of times have been reported. Deep UV resonance Raman spectroscopy usually employs excitation wavelength in the 190 nanometer to 300 nanometer range. There are many advantages of this method and they are related to the sensitivity to the signal enhancement or to the fluorescence background elimination. Resonance effects occur for different spectral ranges and for different chemical modes. This means that by exciting the sample with the right wavelength, we can create selective resonances. For example, the peptide bond absorbs around 190 nanometer. So strong resonances are created and Rama signal coming from the peptide chains, from the proteins actually, can be efficiently and selectively enhanced. The figure below demonstrates the UV Rama resonance selectivity for studying the proteins, for example, 
myoglobin. As shown in the figure, the 415 nanometer excitation will produce strong resonances for proteins having heme structures as the myoglobin. Strong resonances are observed also for the aromatic amino acids when the protein is excited with the 229 nanometers line. Close to 190 nanometer, more precisely 206 nanometer excitation, we will observe strong enhancement of the peptide bond vibrations. This is a clear example which shows that UV Raman resonance is selective. Among the most important advantages of the UV Raman resonance, we can list first the Raman signal enhancement, second the Raman spectral simplification because resonance occurs only for few bands which are associated to the electronic transitions. Often the background is eliminated or strongly decreased. Nevertheless, we can also note some limitations. As for example, the thermal damage of the sample, because usually pulsed lasers, very energetic, are used. Then also another limitation can be the photochemical damage, and this depends on the total photon dose and wavelength. Moreover, UV Raman resonance experimental systems may require advanced skills for the oper operator and maintaining the system at optimal parameter can involve quite high costs. Another possibility to improve the Raman signal of proteins and to ensure a complete analysis is the Raman polarization measurement. How it works? When the molecule interacts with the monochromatic light, the polarizability will change. Actually, the Raman scattering occurs because a molecular vibration can change the polarizability. By changing the propagation of the incident light by polarizing it, we can explore more vibrations in molecule. Thus, different molecular orientation and symmetries can be explored. The intensity of Raman bands can be influenced by positioning the molecule with respect to the laser beam. Note that the excitation of the molecule on one or another symmetry axis can lead to a different Raman scattering. Concerning the proteins, they have several axes of symmetry and you can imagine that using polarized Raman can enrich a lot the information. Polarization measurements help us to identify new conformations. However, the proteins are complex systems with many atoms, bonds and interactions. In many cases, the vibrations modes are mixed or coupled and the polarized Raman may handle these situations also. Even the interpretation of the spectra is not an easy task to do. Usually practical results are compared with theoretical ones. To analyze the polarization properties of Raman scattered radiation, we consider an experimental configuration in which the incident radiation propagates along the z-axis. The direction of observation of the scattered light is the y-direction, you can call it perpendicular observation. X is the direction of the polarization of the electric vector of the incident beam. The scattering molecule is located in the origin of the system. In the figure, you can observe the effect of the polarization in the case of the lysosine. The black spectrum is a Raman scattering along the x-axis, and we will call it the parallel intensity, while the gray spectrum is the Raman scattering along the z-axis, and we will call it the perpendicular intensity. The relation between these two intensities describes 
the depolarization factor. And finally, I would like to present you another type of Raman measurements of proteins, and more precisely, low frequency measurements. These measurements can be considered as complementary to the classical ones. Additional information on the protein structures can be obtained. The low frequency spectral region for the proteins is related to their global motion. All molecules show these low frequency motions. They are collective motions of all the atoms in the protein. These vibrations of the bonding network are sensitive to the environment. Once again, the variations of the temperature, pressure, pH, and even solvents. The Raman bands assigned to these vibrations are very broad, so the theoretical calculations are often used to help the interpretation of the experimental data. Researchers have showed that from thermodynamic point of view, there is a correlation between the low frequencies vibrations and the conformational changes in proteins. Here we have an example where the low frequency measurements were performed on chemotrypsin protein in different solvents or environments. The studied samples were the lyophilic powder of this protein, the acylated uh, sample or solution of this uh, molecule, a film cast which contains dry drop of pure protein in a concentrated solution, a film cast from deuterated protein, and also a film cast from a solution of the protein that had been denaturated with SDS and also a single crystal of this protein. In all these environments, the protein suffers a smaller or a bigger change of conformation. In every case, except the sample that had been denaturated with SDS, a pronounced peak at about 29 cm minus 1 is found. This low frequency band is dependent or conformation and disappears upon the naturation of the protein, strongly suggesting that the SDS denaturation is more destructive than the others. With the description of this last point, I will finish here my presentation on the basics of Raman spectroscopy applied to the proteins. During this presentation, we made an overview of the standard Raman applicability of proteins, which are such complex systems. We saw how many information related to the protein structure can Raman provide. We learned also how to manage the protein spectra in order to improve and to enrich their detection. There are many conclusions that can be made, and I will like to underline some of them. Raman spectroscopy can be successfully used as a method for probing the structure and conformation of native and non-native proteins. Important structural information can be deduced from the specific Raman vibrational bands. Various chemical reactions involving proteins can be studied, especially the folding and unfolding reactions. By processing the experimental results, we get the access to important physical and chemical parameters, which in turn allow the calculation of reaction rates constant. Thus, quantitative studies can be possible. The new instrumental developments make possible the wide ranging analysis of proteins. Polarized Raman, UV Raman resonance, low frequency measurements are only few classical methods which are used to complete and to enrich the Raman detection of proteins. Thank you very much for your kind attention.